So, why should I do shell scripting using Groovy? Because Groovy is cool, uh, because I can, right? Um, but to be honest, it's really, really useful to do complex stuff. Did you ever try to parse a JSON file or XML file in your bash script? It's not one of the easiest tasks you want to do. In Groovy, no problem. This way, you have an easy way as well to test your scripts. Ever tested a bash script? It's not so easy, right? So this way, especially in times of DevOps, no ops, um, this is well a way to make your full chain testable. And of course, if you know Groovy better than Bash, why torture yourself with Bash instead of using Groovy? So, my name is Alexander Klein. Everyone calls me Sasha. Sasha is the Russian short version of Alexander. I'm living in Germany, working for Codecentric in Stuttgart. I'm branch manager there, girl for everything, tech advisor, and still in projects. Yeah, we're doing consulting and software development. So, but let's go into how do I execute any Groovy script? I think every one of you should know this. Execute Groovy, then call the name of your script. Whatever. So this is very easy to do, Zoo. Um, but sometimes it's not so nice that you always have to pre uh, postpone it with uh, no prepone it with Groovy. So on POSIX systems, so Window, um, Linux, and Mac, you can use the shebang command because, as you maybe know, the shebang command is a valid Groovy command. So you can just say shebang, so hash, exclamation mark, and then the command you want to call. So in this case, your path to your Groovy, to your Groovy binary. Or you can use the default environment if you have Groovy um, installed via package, for example, or registered in normal environment, you can just say user bin and Groovy. So this is a thing that I normally do, and you even have additional possibilities like adding a class path by adding arguments to Groovy. So you can just say, okay, let's have the class path is this jar file or this, this directory or whatever. This is normal behavior that you should know from, from Java and Groovy. Um, you as well can use um, system environment variables. So you can just say, okay, take it from my home directory. So this is like doing normal shell stuff. But this is the entrance to using Groovy. And if you like to, you as well can define environment variables. So here you can say, this variable while well, one is value. Then inside of the Groovy script, you have this environment variable set, if you like to and need to. But there's a big problem. This doesn't work so fluently on Linux. It works as expected on uh, Mac, because Mac has a different env um, format for the parameters. And this does not really seamlessly work for, uh, for Linux. It works for the normal simple task, um, calling the, uh, the binary and adding the class path, but not for the environment variables. But you can write your own script that's doing that job. That's not very hard, so you can just, don't want to go into there, if you're interested, you can get slides and copy it out there, but there as well, you can simulate the stuff and then call the Groovy executable via this way, and before that you can set your stuff. So if you really, uh, if you want to do some um, Groovy scripting on your machine, it's very easy to create a shell script, putting somewhere that is called in Groovy using the features, then you can um, do everything you want. What I didn't integrate here is creating own environment variables, because I hadn't, had been too lazy and had no time and so whatever, but it shouldn't be so difficult. But beside that, we have another hacks, or not really hacks, but it's using some things 
um, from the groovy world and from the bash world. That helps us. So let's have a look to this. It, on the first glimpse, it looks normal. The second glimpse, you see, OK, there I have some kind of bin bash, not groovy. And then I have a strange double slash in front of them. And then I have my Groovy script, whatever is in there. So what we use here is that in Groovy, a double slash is a comment. So if you take this script and compile it in Groovy, then you have two comments. The first line is the shebang comment. The second is, <coughs> is the normal comment. If you run that in the bash, what you normally do from starting, um, then it just ignores, then uses the slash for, oh, I have an absolute path, so I get to my root. And if I have a second path, luckily this will be ignored by the bash. So this way, with this trick, it just executes, if you want this script, it's run in the bash script, and the bash script itself runs here, the path to the groovy, with all the stuff that you need. Uh, it's a little bit from the back, between feet to the head. But it works. The next thing is, yeah, here you can do a lot of other things. So, for example, in Linux, where you have these problems with this end, oh, just make, this chase, just make some more comments. Why not? For Groovy, it doesn't matter. And here we say, OK, just that it be, is used, you have to execute something. So you have an executing command here. And export is a shell script, but not a command. So this is just a com uh, yeah, it's a command, but not a program. So I have to run a program for that to work. So because of that, you can easily use the user bin true. That is always just returning true. And after that, the bash takes in and you can export a class path and any options and whatever you would like to do. And then as well, you can just normally execute your Groovy. And you have set your variables and what you want to have and uh, what you want to do. Um, yeah, and from the Groovy side, still, this is just ignored because these are comments. And the next step is using that, we can take or another hack, I would say, that is nice as well, and I really like that, is we're using other features. First of all, we have start our bash. Then you maybe remember in bash we have the keyword rem, for this line is just comment, alternative to the hash sign. So. If we assign a value, in this case a string, you see this is a multi-line string with single colons. Yeah? In Groovy, from the Groovy side, we just assign this crazy looking but just a normal string to this variable. And you know, just assigning a value to a variable doesn't do any harmful things in Groovy, so yeah, that's fine from the Groovy side. It's just an assignment of a string very well, and then I can do my Groovy stuff. This is the groovy side. But from the bash side, I see, OK, um, here, this comment, this is a comment line. Because uh, this is one because it's a shebang. This is because it's rem. And this is because it's a, the hash sign. What is as well a common sign in bash? I just had some documentation. So here is the bash stuff. And here I can do what I like to. Oh, I just see I have a double export. Please export me. Um, uh, excuse me. So you can just export the class path and export the options and whatever, and then you can run your, um, your stuff. And here, I just do an exit, so all the rest down is not read anymore, and I'm happy. So everything can come there. So this is a really nice hack. I have to say this is not mine. I found it. Uh, I got it sent by email by a um, viewer of, the, um, of my former version of this presentation, and I'm very, very happy that he sent it to me because this is nice, and it leads us to a solution for Windows batches. Because it as well this way, it works as well for Windows. 
in any case you have to or want to do that on a Windows machine. So here we just have the echo off. So we don't want to protocol what we are doing. So here we do the same trick with the rem, but we just use normal slashes, uh, it's a slashy string. Why? Uh, Windows has this ugly behavior of using backslashes for path, so it's easier using the slashy string. You as well could do that with dollar slashy strings. So, and RAM, luckily, is as well a, uh, for bash, is a comment. So this first line that we need for our groovy stuff um, is just ignored. So here are some other comments for ex explaining what things not needed. So and then I set some options and I set some class path and then I execute my groovy executable where I say, okay, please use this file for the groovy um, and give, give it all these arguments. And then exit. Uh, then, then go to end of file, so to the end, so this means exiting. On the Groovy side, as I said, we do the same trick, we just assign the rem. Uh, here, the first trick is the add sign is an um, annotation. And luckily this just got ignored. For the first sign, if we do this nice trick here, so we create an interface with the name echo, right? That does nothing. It's just there that the first line is a valid interface named echo, and we can just ignore it, or it just ignores it. It doesn't do anything harmful now. So, this, I really, he's a cute guy. Um, brilliant, it's really nice. So, this is the trick down here that we add the interface echo that the first line will be ignored and everything is valid. We're happy. And luckily, Groovy um, does a multiple pass through in the compiler. So it first looks if there are any class or interface definitions, then registers them, and then does that a second time. And when the second time he says, oh, I have an interface called Echo, so I'm happy I can use it. Yeah, so this is a really nice trick, and it works on, the Windows, on Windows machines. So this way, you just can make a file, my magic Groovy batch script dot bat and you can just run it as it is. I wouldn't call it a hack, but it is, but it's really nice. So another thing is, um, yeah, now we have these things running, but, you know, starting up a Java virtual machine sometimes takes really long time, or longer than you wanted to. And luckily there is a project called GroovySurf, that's doing the same for any Groovy script that is Gradle doing with the Gradle daemon. Um, who knows the Gradle daemon? Okay, Gradle daemon works this way that, uh, and Groovy Surf as well, that it just, um, the first time you call it, it um, a JVM process is started and it's running in the background. And this JVM process is always running in the background, and when the script is finished, it will not stop. It will automatically stop after some timeout time, um, but in the meantime, it's just idling there, and waiting that for the next time when the command is called, a script is handled to this Java virtual machine, so it can be run inside of this already running virtual machine. So, for the second time when we call a groovy script via groovy surf, then the JVM is already running and doesn't have to be initialized and started up. So this really time uh, makes the thing faster by the factor 10 to 20, depending on your machine. So if you ever have some colleagues complaining that the, uh, your scripts that you wrote in this strange language um, need so long to start up, try it with GroovySurf. So, but how can we get this Groovy serve on your machine? So on Windows, you have it automatically if you use the normal Groovy installer. It's part of the Windows installation. You ha just have to use it. If you're using lin Linux or Mac, or first of all, it works with both, I really suggest 
use SDK man. Who is using SDK man already? Very good, almost three quarters. For the last quarter, I really advise to use it well. I think you heard it multiple times this conference. Um, and if you have SDK man installed, just SDK install Groovy Surf and you're happy. You can just use it. For Mac, you as well have it in, in Brew. Brew install Groovy Surf. Um, if you have to install it binary, it's easy as unpacking and uh, running a setup script and that's it, exporting a path. So, but how do I use it? Very easy, I just do Groovy Surf instead of Groovy. So, I can say instead of Groovy my script, I can say Groovy Client. Ah, it's called Groovy Client. This is the client side of the Groovy Surf. So it's provided with the Groovy Surf installation. So you just do a Groovy Client, and then my script, or in Groovy Env, you as well can call the Groovy Client. I do all the other tricks we just did before. Just change Groovy to Groovy Client. So far, I just told you something about how to get the things running. Now, how to write the scripts. First of all, we have a little restriction. Um, and this restriction, I think it makes a little bit sense that we are falling back to the Java times, where we had the restriction that um, a class file and the file name is matching. And for Java, I didn't really understand, but here I really understand, because the thing is, if I have a shell script and I want to instantiate a class that is not in the same file, the Groovy environment has to find it. And because of that, we only can rely on the path name. So if you want to have um, another script found from inside of your script, because you have some library, you have some other classes, what you ever do, um, then just be sure that you have one class in there and the class name is the same name as the file name. But beside that, we can do anything what we can do in Groovy. So, first of all, how do we execute some commands? Very easy. We have a string. And string nicely has a default Groovy method called execute. And this executes this command that we defined in the string here on your system, on your local environment. So in Windows or in Linux. So, and sometimes maybe you know it is tedious with these strange um, spaces in between, because how determine if this is a space that is part of the parameter or a space that is separating the parameters? So in the shell, you do some escaping of the parameter uh, of the space or something like that. You easily here as well can do have an execute on a list. So you can just put these arguments, and the first one is the command, and the second one are all the parameters. So here, this space, it automatically knows that. My directory is one parameter. I don't have to escape it, it just works as it is. Another thing that I want to do is uh, giving or telling me in which working directory I want to execute. So, because of that, the execute has two parameters. One, we'll see that, is a map, uh, is a list of uh, environment variables that I want to give with a call. And the second one, is the directory, in, what is the working directory for the execution. Yeah, and as I said, the list of these arguments is a bit strange, but here really it is a list, not a map. Hmm, not so nice, but okay. Um, and this, this list you have the name equals and then the value of these arguments. And there you can have multiples. So here you can just define multiple environment variables with the execution of your script. This as well, for sure, works for strings and for lists. Um, the problem is that in these lists of environment variables here, and even here, the default environment variables are not part of it. So you don't have it in here. So what I do for trick is that I say, OK, I have a map. In my map, I put my normal arguments as Key is the very name and value be comes behind. And then I say with the asterisk in, um, in the map, um, there you have the advantage that it takes another map 
because where is it here? System env is a map or a map-like structure, and this means with the ASCII risk, it just takes all the keys and values, all the key value pairs, and copies them into this map. So just take every key and the corresponding value and put it in this map. And on top of that, then I add my var1. So in this way, I easily have copied over all my normal existing environment variables in the one that should be executed. But, as I said, we need a list of these strange strings with these escape files. So, Groovy gives us, gives us some help. We just do a collect, and then we just concatenate that with an equal sign. Then we have a list of that, and then we can just put, uh, give that to the execute command. So, it's not obvious, but it works very nicely. So, and if I want to access the result that the command is giving me, so I have this nice get text method, or as it is in Groovy, the text property. The interesting thing is that when I call execute, um, this command is not blocking. Um, so I can execute something and do something else. But if I do a dot text, or I do get text, then um, it is blocking until it gets the result, otherwise it Mm, it's not so easy. Otherwise, we would need a stream. Um, okay, then it's waiting for them, and then I have it, give, it gives it me to as a string, and I can do everything that I want to, as I'm used to in Groovy. So, and here, the same thing for Windows. Um, in Linux, you can just do it. Linux and Mac, you can just do as you would do it on a shell. But here. I really advise you uh, always to use the command shell with slash c, which means this command, and this is the command by, behind there. Because just directory um, doesn't give you, give you what you want if it works at all. So it depends on the Windows version, Windows 95, it doesn't work at all, and so on. So just postpone it with command slash c. Um, Another thing is, as I said, here it's waiting for the text, but if we want to have some um, fluent information, um, then we can as well get the, get the stream. And on a stream in Groovy, we know we can iterate over each line, for example, so this way we can just print every line. And as a shortcut for input stream, we as well can just say in. So, and if it, there is an in, there is as well an error. For the error um, output, there we can do the same. It's another string. Sometimes we want to have the same in one, um, or very often we want to have the same uh, error and, in, and output stream, um, standard output stream and standard error stream in one stream. So therefore, if I start a new process, if I have a process object that I can do with the process builder, then I can say redirect error stream true, then everything that goes to the error stream goes to the standard output stream. So you can catch it as one. So and then you can do that as you like to. So for some process control, so if you do the execute, you as well get a process back where you as well can do your redirect access, um, redirect error stream, as I just said. And then you can say, wait for. Means, yeah, just wait until this proce process is finished. It's the same as what's done automatically with text, but text returns the text. If you don't want to have a text back, just do the wait for. And you as well, a process.exit value, and then you can do some error handling, handling if the exit value is not nice, or it doesn't, it's not, um, not positive, or is something different than one, a eh, zero. Um, or you as well can have a wait for, that is as well returns, I think it returns true and false, um, where you can just say, okay, then I can have as well do some error handling there. Um, waiting indefinitely is sometimes very dangerous because of yet that you can set timeouts. So 
you not only have a wait for, but as well a wait for or kill, where you can just give a timeout, in this case, for one second. So if this command takes lang lang longer than a second, it will get killed. And sometimes you have long-running processes that you want to have running in the background, like starting a server or something like that. And when you're finished, you want to stop it. So here you just get the process object, and later on you can just say destroy. And this is manual kill of the process. So now we have the control. Now we have, want to have a look to the output. So um, for example here, we have this my command that I execute, and then I just have this wait for process output. This means um, this moment it waits until it gets some information in one of these streams that I get him here, give him here. And in this case, I just give it these buffers, and then automatically these streams will be sent to the buffer, and then can do, and then I can do everything that I want to. So, printing in this case, or analyzing, or whatever. Um, here, for example, I say, okay, remove the foo.temp in my temporary directory, and you see, minus F or something, there are some situations, especially in Windows, um, and especially for delete or remove commands, that you need to consume the output of, output of the process, otherwise you get a deadlock. I'm very sorry, I don't know the reason why this happens, but it happens from time to time. And if so, you're safe, or it's better to just say, okay, consume the process output, and then you can easily wait for it, and this block will not happen. From the shell, you know the concept of piping commands. You have the same thing in Groovy as well, with the processes, because the process have a, have a pipe to method, so you can just say, okay, here I get a process from this less, then the result will be piped to this, and then I just wait for the text. And you as well can do it with a little bit of operator overloading. Here we have the pipe sign that works as the pipe to method. So you can just say, okay, this is a process, pipe other process. Something that you normally or many of us la like working in the shell are wild cards. The problem is wild cards don't work. Anyone an idea why they don't work? Hmm? They're expanded by the shell and they're not in the shell. That's correct, absolutely correct. So because of that, because we don't automatically call the shell it will not get expanded and it's looking for an asterisk.java file and it won't find it, hopefully. But we can just use the shell to do that for us. So we just need to do shell minus c or cmd slash c and then everything works fine with the wildcards. This is just doing the So. And we now talked about a lot of things that we all, all I think, say, hmm, it's good to know, but it's a bit unhandy and unintuitive. And why do I have to know so many things? Because of that, I started to write a little helper, and you're all free to use it or misuse it in any cases, as long as you don't make me responsible for it. Where I just say, OK, I create myself a shell class. OK, this has some properties like environment, and by default, I take the system environment. And then I say, OK, uh, this is my directory, my working directory, and I have the, sh of, should I redirect the error stream and a default timeout? <coughs> Nothing magic. OK, then I give a method, uh, it's a little DSL-like, I just give a method, method where I can add um, arguments to my environment to give different um, different new variables um, and two methods to set a new file, a working directory as a file or as a string. 
And I just make the setter for redirect error streams and a setter for the timeout. It's not really a setter, but in a fluent API builder way. So the next step is doing the execution. And in my execute of my shell, I say, OK, let's do some things in. I, in this case, expect that I'm on a Linux machine or on a, on a Mac machine. I use my normal shell. And I always say, OK, execute or build a process with shell minus C and then the command that is provided. This way, I always use the shell so I don't have problems with wildcards. I don't have to think about that. Next thing is I set my directory and my redirect error, redirect error stream and my environment variables with these strange uh, list of um, collect and then start my process. Nothing magic, magic is just simplifying life. Then I do give a call method. Um, and in this call method, this is normally the thing that I call for running something, where I say, OK, they, here's, here's my command, and then should I consume the output? But I just say, OK, give me the process from this, from this command, and do the other stuff, wait for, wait for, and kill, timeout, and so on. And return the exit value. Yeah, and as last but not least, I just do for simplifying and giving me something that I often have to use, I as well do in each line on my standard input. So, very easy. And then I can use it this way. I can say, OK, let's give me an instance of this shell. And then I say, oh, shell.call, make me this directory. Or I don't have to use the dot .call because in Groovy specification, it's defined that every object that has a call method can be executed like a method. So this is the same thing how closures will be executed. Closures as well have a call method, and this is the method that will be called. This is nothing closure specific. This works for all objects as well as my shell object. So this is the same than that beside the command. And as here I say, OK, the shell execute this command on this directory. There I like it more to have the call, but you as well can have these double brackets there. Um, or each line iterate, please, over my files, or iterate over the lines of these files. So this is just the helper simplifier, just giving you a tip what you could do. So some other helpful stuff I want to run through um, is yeah, how to access system variables. For example, a P a PW, uh, PWD. Yeah, you can just do system.env for the environment var variables and say dot PWD. Um, if these are the same thing with the properties, system.properties, then you have access to the properties. Um, and you see this property has a dot in there. Because of that, just put it in as a string. Just put the name in um, single or double quotes or slash strings or whatever. And this works here as well if you have strange characters in there. So sometimes you have need of your own process ID. So the, or on Linux machines, Linux um, or Mac machines, the process ID of the process of this script for whatever reason. This is unfortunately not so easy. But with a little trick using the mbeans, you can just say, OK, with the management factory that is here, give me the runtime bean, it's the current one, the name, and then split it. And what is before the at sign, this is my process ID. So this is a little way how to get hold of your pit. So another helpful thing to use um, is the command line builder, because very often you have some command options that you want to give to your commands, arguments. And the command builder um, is a small DSL on top of the Apache client, uh, or Apache Common CLI. So you just have the builder and you give a usage, usage string. So this is in the help file that's called usage is that and that. Can be longer. And then you can say, OK, 
cli.v, or I just wrap it in, in a width so I don't have to repeat the, v, um, the cli colon uh, dot. So these, the argument minus v, or in long option, is minus minus version. Huh? And then I have some documentation, some description, that will be shown in the help screen. So, and then I say, okay, I parse the arguments from the normal main method, and in the, in the script, you have the main method arguments in these magic variable args in your binding. Um, and if I have, if, if I have no binding, or if, if there's, there's nothing, um, then it's just exiting. And this happens, there is false or not null there if there is an, it's in the wrong format. There's something that's not there. The help will automatically shown in this moment. And then here is where, okay, if it's the option, if it has the option V, then I do that. So I print the version. Or a little more complex example with some other options. Um, okay, I say my usage. Oh, this is uh, just to say, this is the output for the help page that we are creating now. So we want to have a minus, ask, uh, minus question mark and a minus minus help for getting help information. We want a minus minus config with an argument, but there is no short option. Here we just have a short option, minus d, and it has some values that are separate or key value pairs that are separated with the question mark as you know them with the minus d's from Java. Uh, and this could be multiple ones. And here we have the minus s or minus minus source as the source directory with any argument. Here we have minus source, not minus minus source, but minus source, and with the directory that should be Elias for one of these, and the minus v and minus version. So how to achieve that? Same thing. Command line builder, usage. Okay, nice. Then here I have these source. This is the minus source. Here I had these minus source, you see? Because here you always give the short option. Like minus V later on. And the long option here is minus minus version. But here you give the short version. So this is minus source. Then we say, okay, this has an argument. The argument is called path in the description. It is not optional. And here's the description. Now we have the config. And the config should be a minus minus config, but it doesn't have a short option. So how should we use the short option without having one? Therefore, we have the special name underscore. So you can have multiple underscores with there. And this is just tells the command line builder, oh, there is no short option for this option. So in here we say, okay, it has one argument, this is called arg, and it is as well not optional in description. For the s, is the minus s, and the minus minus source in this case, we have the same thing with the arguments. Um, here we have the question mark, because question mark is no valid character for a method name, and this is builder pattern, so it is uh, valid as a builder, a builder uh, node. Um, so we just have to put it into... Um, quotes. Then everything works as expected. The version as well we had for the minus d with these value pairs we have some support for these arguments. Okay, and we know we have pairs, so it could be a multiple as well. But we have two pairs in one argument and these are separated by the equal sign. So it automatically splits my stuff later on. And then I give uh, the name for that, and then just give some description. And working with that looks very easy. So I say, okay, parse my arguments. Then, if this is, um, if there is no option, or if it, there is a mistake in there, sorry, if it doesn't, something goes wrong, then exit. And the help page had been automatically shown if there is an error. And here. I just say, okay, if it's a question mark, the option question mark, then call the usage, so call the help method. This automatically prints the help method. Or if it is a V, then print the version. If it is option, if it has the um, option config, 
then print this configuration string. If it has minus D, then say, OK, we get the options with these Ds. So it automatically gets, adds this property with these S because there are multiples of them because it set arguments too. Um, so then, we have these arguments. I can get this list with the S. This is a list where I have the first of the, um, if I have A equals B, B equals C, then I have a list with A, B, B, C. Because of that, because I know that I have pairs, I just collate it, so I split this list in a list of lists with two elements each. Then I have a list where I have the key and the value, so A, B, and the next is B, C. And then I can just, in this case, work with it. Here I can just say, okay, join it again and print it out, or do whatever you want to. Um, I as well here um, take access the home directory. I say, okay, the home directory, here I say, if it's not set, then it's the home. Otherwise, it's what they give it with source. And then I can do everything. And this, the arguments, is how I get hold of all the arguments that have no minus or minus minus presets. So everything that comes after that, maybe a list of files. So I can get these arguments, I can iterate over it and do what I want to. Um, yes, there are many options, it's very powerful, and it's very, very useful. Um, and with Groovy 2.5, that hopefully will come soon out, um, the CLI builder has a new syntax, um, or new possibility to use using annotations. This could simplify life as well, another one, uh, another bit. So, how much time do we have? Sorry? Eight minutes? Great, because I have something prepared before we come to the stop. And another thing, what's really nice, is dependency management. Who of you knows grapes? Half of you, about. Okay, great is the groovy internal um, dependency management if you want to access other libraries, other jars. So it's called, Grape is called Groovy Adaptable Packaging Engine. For any reason, if someone did not know that yet. And you can do that. It's an interesting thing because of this feature. It had been introduced that you can annotate packages, something you, you cannot do in Java. And you couldn't do beforehand in Groovy either, but it made um, the most sense to annotate a package with the grab annotation because it, you can annotate where this package comes from or where it should load from, included into the class path. So here we have the group org spring framework and the module string arm, and th this is the version. So it's the same thing or one of the syntaxes you as well can use in Gradle. So you can just put it there, and then automatically, it works in your groovy shell and works in every script, everywhere. It's just, if it's not on the system, it's downloading the thing automatically from JCenter and so on, and put it into your class path, and then it starts your script. Really nice and convenient. Um, you as well can use the other, these one string syntax, as well, the same thing like in Gradle. Everything that is downloaded is for your information stored in your home directory dot groovy slash grape. So there you can find it. Um, as I said, it's possible to, or it makes the most sense to annotate in packages, but it doesn't matter, you can annotate everything with at grab, wherever you want to. And yeah, most, mostly you see it in import statements. Um, you have the group. The group is the normal Maven ID, as I said, for IV organization, the module and the artifact. Uh, module is the artifact and then the version, as I said. Um, you can as well define ranges if you like to. I wouldn't always do that. Very rarely. Where well, you can say everything between version 1 and version 2. Oh, uh, version 1.0, this should be a dot, sorry, I just saw, typo. 
um, or something like 2.1 and greater, and so on. I as well can add classifiers, so everything you want to need and you're used to from any Maven repository or Ivory repository. And if you have multiples, multiples of them, you either can annotate multiple import statements or something, or you can just say, okay, um, I have these grapes, not just one grep, and you annotate that with a list of grabs. So if you have a list, don't forget the comma at the end, one of the common mistakes. So and you can configure this stuff a little bit in your .groovy grape config XML. There you can say, okay, where is my cache? Default by groovy grapes, but you can change it to anywhere where you want to. Um, you as well can have the local Maven directory for local installation. If you have it in a different path, you as well can use that because it as well looks first in your local um, Maven in your Ma in Ma Maven local if it's there. So another thing as well, it hits or goes to JCenter. And as JCenter is a, a hub or a uh, proxy to Maven Central, you have everything you have, normally you have out in the wild. Um, so it uses the JCenter. After that, it as well uses the iBiblio. In the past, it used the, the Codehouse repository, but this is history. And as well, it's accessing to the Java Net, but as well, this is history because they are going down. So this is what they currently do. And you as well have a chance to take control over the resolution. So you can as well, as well give a grab resolver and give your own Maven or IV repository if you have your own in your in your company. So just with the annotation grab resolver, you can define your own, and then you can use it here. You have problems with transitive, uh, transitive dependencies. Means you have two imports, or two grabs that you want to import, and both have, for example, a groovy dependency. So they both bring, with, bring along their Groovy dependency. The problem is, what if one of these is Groovy 2.1 and the other is 2.4.10? Then we have conflict. Um, the grab system is not as mighty as Gradle, but still we have some influence. First of all, we can say, okay, for this grab, exclude, please exclude this, in this case, the XML APIs. APIs. Um, as well, another thing what we can do is, um, very rarely, but it is very important if you want to grab a JDBC driver, then the JDBC driver has to be put to the class path before your application. Because when your application comes in the class path, it tries to find the stuff in your... Uh, finds all JDBC driver in your class path, and if there is nothing, because it comes later, we have a problem. Because of that, you have to put it in the system class loader. Because of that, we have the system class loader true with the grab config, so this is put into the system class loader directly and not in your application class. Context class loader, um, and where, where it's just automatically initializing the context class loader, so you can use the context class loader, um, and you can define it for the current thread. Um, you have an auto-download for these grabs, you can say false or whatever, and you can disable checksummings, because sometimes you have buggy repositories out there in the wild, and the library or the jar file is fine, but the checksum is crap. So you can willingly disable that. So this is for proxies. And another problem for ending, for the last thing that has came upon is proxies. 
one of my most hated features in development area, you know? Anyone here who had the same feelings and problems? Great. So, it's not really something with scripting, but you can really use it here, is how do I configure my proxy, my local proxy? And I can say, okay, HTTP proxy host as variables as um, minus D, and we remember we could do that um, in our script in the header as well. Um, we have the host and the port, and if you need it, a user and the password, and then your script. Or you can just put that in a system environment variable and put it like there and then use it. I think then it's as well, if it's in the, in the environment by starting Groovy, then it's automatically activated or used. And then I hope I had some useful tips for you for writing Groovy scripts as scripts on your shell and automating your, automating your system. And if there are any questions, feel free. Could you go back to the Windows account where you find this interface with the annotation? <laughs> no problem. If I find it. Um, this is the Windows version. Should I ask any question or should I just start to try to explain it again? Good. So, first of all, let's have a view to the batch script, so the Windows site of these twofold thing. So, for the batch, one thing we w really want to have is that we ignore all the whole batch script because automatically it will echo to the, con to the standard output. Because of that, we have to add the add echo off, right? So this is our first line. Then, from Windows side, we have the rem, that is the command in Windows batches. And so this means this line is just the command for the batch side. And this as well, and this as well, because it's uh, pre yeah, prepended with, post, uh, with rem. Whatever rem means, I don't know. So the next thing is we have, we can do anything we would, what we normally would do in a batch file, for example, setting any class files, any system environments, uh, whatever you could imagine. And then I just call the groovy binary. So please replace the path to, to, your, to your really groovy path, right? So, and then we take this strange little um, syntax that means as a file name. So here it says, okay, groovy, and then we need, there have the same name than this script is. So this is the, uh, the thing for getting the name of my file, right? And this, please, with the absolute path. This is my current path, and this is my current file name as far as I have in mind. Okay. Just for... And then go to the end. Okay, finished. Let's go to the Groovy site. For the Groovy site, the first line is a problem because this is not valid. The first moment, right? So, the second, this is a assignment of a variable with the name rem, R-E-M. Oh, sorry. Okay, um, we have these, these rem, and then we have starting a string and ending a string in a slash string, slashy string. And then we have something that from the groovy side is just ignored because um, it is assigned, but nothing is done with the rem. So then we are here. Then we have two other comments. And then normally we would just have our groovy script. But we still have the problem with these echo off. Um, because the compiler would complain, I don't know any annotation with the name echo. And because of that, I create one. The syntax for creating an annotation is add interface. 
and I create one with the name echo. And it's just empty. So, yeah. Okay, so I, I suggest just come to me and So if you like to just come down, I think we the time is out.